we are going to hear next from Yen Tan, co-founder of Kona, the employee support and people analytics platform for remote teams. Yen's work on people-first leadership has been featured by Fortune, Yahoo, TechCrunch, Entrepreneur, Harvard Business School, Forbes, and more. They've spoken at remote work conferences like GitLab Comet 2021 and advised Fortune 10 companies on remote strategy. In their free time, Yen likes exploring LA bookstores and boba shops and convincing their partner that they could use another plant, which is just such a great little tidbit. Hi, Yen. Thanks for being here. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So we actually had a poll that I will go ahead and pull up. I'll pull it up in a second, but if you would like to share your screen, Yen, I'm so excited for you to share about Kona because I'm relatively new to the Slack app community building, culture building world, and Kona is pretty innovative in that sense. Absolutely. And I actually wanted to design this as a workshop. So you will definitely be learning about Kona and our ethos behind the project. You'll also learn a lot more about burnout and hopefully have some tooling there to address your own burnout and well-being journey. I'm sure all of us are on different stages of that journey. So that poll that Stephanie just mentioned is a quick little check-in. The product is really based in these little hearts, green, yellow, and red. So if green is great, yellow, okay, and red, terrible, audience spread across everywhere. How are you feeling today? And yeah, maybe we can put up that quick poll or just see how folks are doing in the comments too. Yeah, absolutely. I put it here. And then if you're on inside.com, I put it in this event in the comments section. Let's see. Oh, we've got four votes here. It. Why do I not see the results? Oh, I have to answer before I see the results. Oh, yay. 60% are on green and 40% are on yellow. We've got no reds today. Okay. <laughs> Thing. And that 40% yellow, thank you so much for your vulnerability. It can be hard to admit that you're not feeling bright and green all the time, but I think that's really important in this little workshop that we'll be doing. We'll get into that for sure. So yeah, I'm going to move on, but please keep sharing how you're feeling and let's make that normal to talk about at work. So a quick introduction about myself. Stephanie gave that fantastic introduction earlier. My name is Yen. I co-founded this startup with two other students at UCLA back in 2019. We were really passionate about making remote work less shitty. In my French, we wanted to make it a lot more humane, make folks happier and prioritize well-being. And we just noticed, especially as the pandemic rolled on, how crucial that mission was. A lot of folks face isolation. They're having to be full-time parents and caretakers while also managing a full-time job. And burnout is something that we keep hearing across all sorts of news outlets, but also just in our day-to-day -day regular lives. Before I dive in, I do also want to acknowledge that like I burned out as early as like last summer as well, just ironically doing this kind of burnout well-being startup. It's a very tricky problem. Even folks that study it and talk about it every single day do fall into its trap. And so I definitely want to talk today about why that is, what kind of things you can do to stop that, and also ways that our tool is actively helping prevent burnout for remote teams at scale. So yeah, pretty exciting topics today. And a lot of this is based off the ethos of the research we've done. In building this product, we've interviewed over a thousand remote managers across great teams and companies. There's so many of them and stuff. And that research has been featured in some awesome things that you've been heard mentioned earlier. So the first thing I want to do is define and label this, this collective monster. Burnout occurs when the demands of our day-to-day -day work or home experience chronically outstrips our capacity to meet those demands. And I think it's a pretty straightforward definition, but you'll also notice that work or home experience, that's not necessarily just work-related. We can get burnt out by caretaking and by having our boundaries crossed there. We can have burnout from being a full-time student and really being stressed by the kind of demands of that program. So burnout is literally anything that pushes you past your limits. And there isn't one way or one kind of cause to that. As we're looking at it, we also can see the stats on burnout. Over 63% of managers experienced burnout in the pandemic. A very scary stat when you also realize that those managers are responsible for the employee experience for the majority of their teams and employees. 52% of those exiting employees said their manager could have done something. And so we're asking the most burnt out portion of our work population to be the ones caring the most and ensuring the retention of the majority of our teammates. And on top of that, 62% of teams said that managers' discussions on mental health would have helped. That being said, it's really easy to buy into the stigma that's still present against mental health and not talk about these problems. 
And so as we're like pursuing Kona and talking about Kona, we're really trying to understand how do we fight against stigma and how do we incorporate some of these learnings to improve retention, improve employee engagement and make people feel fulfilled at work. So as we're going into definitions, it's also really helpful to define what burnout looks like. And this can actually be used as a self check-in exercise for yourself. So see if you check any of these three boxes. The first being, I feel extremely emotionally exhausted. No matter how much sleep or rest or free time I'm getting, I still feel really drained at the end of the day. The second thing, perceived inefficacy, a very fancy word for saying I feel less effective at my job than I normally am. If you feel like you just suck at things, it might not be you. It might be the fact that you're actively burning out. And that's something really important to call out that this is perceived. Oftentimes increased senses of imposter syndrome or feeling lackluster at your job or performance could be due to burnout. And so that's a very interesting facet. The last one is increased cynicism, this feeling of hopelessness, depressive like symptoms. Burnout really sucks the joy and light out of whatever you're doing. And so if you do start to notice maybe a depressive episode come back with more fervor or the fact that you feel like your job is leading nowhere, there are things that maybe you can check in about yourself that maybe this is a temporary situation due to burnout and pushing yourself past your limits and not necessarily a crisis of faith or a crisis of not loving your job anymore. From that, in the comments, perhaps, does anybody feel like they're actively experiencing burnout? I know I'm definitely getting a little bit close on the first two. Anybody experience any of these different things? Yeah, while we wait for people to chime in, I'll just put Minaj's comment here. Such a great tool. I think so as well. Yen, you're talking about these three like character traits, and I feel like burnout is nebulous and hard to nail down. Do you... Uh, pin like a time frame to burnout? Is it something that where you have to be emotionally exhausted for a certain amount of time or feel like you're not doing well at your job for a week plus for it to qualify as burnout? I think I hesitate to assign like a very strict time bound just because all of us are so very different. But I will say that if this is somewhat of a chronic thing. So we're all allowed to have bad days. Maybe you give a presentation that you feel like you completely boofed and that happens to all of us. And maybe you feel a little bit less efficacy because of that. If that feeling though persists, that somehow you feel like you just keep messing up and that you can't stop messing up, that could be some a symptom of burnout actually. It's not just you, which is really interesting. So love it. All right. Yeah, definitely. So as we're moving on, I think it's also really important to call out the different consequences that occur because of it. You'll notice a lot of these are physical symptoms too, which is quite interesting given that we often think of burnout as just in our heads. So some consequences of burnout, chronic feet, fatigue or insomnia, more frequent short-term illness, long-term health conditions and loss of appetite are just a few different symptoms that you can start to notice. Your body basically sending the alarm flares that burnout is actively happening and that you're pushing yourself way beyond what you can handle. If you're somebody, let's just say, for example, you get migraines, Typically migraines, although they're still trying to figure out the exact cause, are caused by stress. And so if you start to notice that your migraines become a lot more frequent, that could also be an early signal, your body basically trying to tell you that you're actively burning out. So we need to actually address and talk about burnout. We need to normalize conversations about it to make sure that we're getting ahead of it because all too often we see burnout as fact of working in today's world when really it's a very negative consequence that hopefully we can prevent with a lot of proactive measures. Things that cause burnout are actually very multifaceted and tied directly to the culture at the company. And so things like indifferent managers or ill-trained managers that have not had any support or maybe are struggling to keep up with their own demands of their job can definitely factor into employee burnout. Limited PTO options or as a matter of fact, unlimited PTO options that are impossible to take advantage of are another factor that make it very impossible to actually take proper time off. Mental health stigma that we've addressed before, and I have a few stats in later slides just addressing the weight of that. Poor boundary setting for the individual, the kind of feeling that work is my definition of my value as an individual, that can definitely cause burnout. And also a lack of appreciation. The investment in recognition programs cannot be understated. HR teams being able to invest in celebrating their employees and recognizing efforts is really important here. So where is all this kind of stuff coming from? I think the root cause, despite all the different kind of cultural factors that happen inside an organization, is the way that our brains are wired, and particularly the ways that our brains are wired to us like react to fear. There's a tiny, tiny part of your brain called the amygdala that basically reacts to stress. 
And the amygdala is designed basically to help you survive in a life or death situation. It activates your muscles to get tighter. It draws energy away from your stomach to put energy into other places. That's usually great for tigers or maybe bears in the wild where you see this threat and you're able to run faster or hide more effectively than you would if you were just calm in a normal state. But nowadays, we don't actually face tigers that often. We face emails from a boss or emails from coworkers with high urgency. These are actually opening the same amount of stressors sometimes as the kind of tiger that we see in the bushes. And as a result, we're opening things called stress cycles. Essentially, you notice a stressor, you have a negative reaction to said stressor, and then your body kind of increases sensitivity to those stressors in order to adapt to the presence of that. And over time, you can see this create a positive feedback loop where you're just becoming a lot more stressed more easily. If you're the kind of person saying, why am I always stressed or anxious about stuff? It's not just you. There is a chemical backing to why this is happening. And as you can think of multiple times per day, if you find yourself opening more stress loops, these are just fully cycling throughout your day, scaling out to the month, the year, multiple years until you do face things like burnout. The good news, or actually before I get into the good news, sorry, this is my bad news slide. Remote employees do need help with this. Given that folks are locked behind screens and oftentimes remotely located across the entire globe, we're finding a lot more folks that aren't aware or able to access resources. 24.9% of employees said they didn't know or have any resources at work. That might not be true, but they just aren't aware of any resources. And 95% of, of people who took time off work for stress didn't actually tell their manager the right reason. So stigma and a lack of awareness of resources are huge blockers for these different types of folks. And unfortunately, that means that folks are fighting these stress cycles by themselves alone in their own offices, or maybe they're working out of their kitchens. And so we really need to address that. The good news is that you can break the cycle. And by breaking the cycle over time, you can start to cure things like burnout. You can break the cycle literally by altering the way that the cycle and the loop happens, literally breaking the kind of chain that's happening. Instead of just noticing a stressor, reacting to the stressor, and immediately going into increased sensitivity, having a positive coping strategy, it's not just bubble baths, and we'll get into those in just a sec, but having some sort of positive coping strategy and recognition can allow you to really cut that stress cycle right in its tracks and allow you to really establish more positive associations and essentially break those dozen or so loops that are happening every single day. So the way we break them is boundaries, a very commonly used phrase used in therapy. Boundaries basically are just defined as the limits and rules of what's acceptable and healthy for an individual. And I would argue that it's every company's responsibility to be stewards of employee boundaries and employee well-being. So the way that we can do that is a few things, recognizing first what good and bad boundaries look like. As managers and leaders of companies, we need to start noticing different types of things at our, for our remote teammates to understand whether they have good or bad boundaries. Are they constantly working overtime? Are they constantly on Slack? Do they say yes to everything or are they always worried while off? Sometimes we encourage these behaviors because we see it as dedication to work, but showed unbridled, we can start to open up way more stress cycles and burn out our employees over time. That definitely does not help with productivity. Meanwhile, good boundaries can look like clocking out of work on time, having life, vibrant lives outside of work. I heard Buffer mentioned in the last kind of panel, and essentially Buffer has had a four-day work week for the last three years, and they've been able to establish vibrant lives outside of their work because of it. So different types of facets and cultural support can really make a huge difference for all these different things. Finally, realistic workload and truly restful rest. These are just some of the ways that we can start to notice in our employees, do they have solid boundaries? And for the employees themselves, there's a lot of different stress cycle breakers available to them. And it often starts with saying no to work or at least saying this is how much work I can really handle. So doing things like taking PTO, reinforcing your boundaries of I can handle this, but I can't handle that. Sweating it out and doing exercise. I just picked up Krav Maga and it's completely changed my life because I'm regularly sweating, which is gross, but at least it definitely cuts through that stress. Reflecting on your needs and priorities, practicing meditation or gratitude, finding community and prioritizing sleep and recovery. These are just some of the stress cycle breakers that can happen that employees are responsible for, but just so companies are also responsible to encourage and create processes around to enable employees to be able to self-resource and help themselves. So I've been talking at you for quite a long while, but I'm very excited to show you how Kona establishes different types of checks and processes and habits to enable employees to support 
their needs in real time, allow managers to understand whether an employee is stressed and perhaps burning out, and take interventions to actually support and self-resource for a lot of these different folks. So if I can figure this out, I'm just gonna switch my screen really quick. But just taking a quick pulse, there is gonna be a Q&A section at the very end where I can answer a lot of your questions about burnout and stress. So please start thinking about those. And let me just switch over to my other screen. Yeah, everyone, please feel free to bring your questions to the comment section, whether you're watching on YouTube, LinkedIn, inside.com, we will definitely bring questions to Yen. And maybe I'll try and revisit that poll, see if anyone else contributed how they're doing. Fantastic. I think that's I think that's so amazing that you took up Krav Maga is mm -hmm. really martial arts. <laughs> Out of all the martial arts, that's a pretty hardcore one. <laughs> Very fun and definitely a very good workout. So yeah, let me jump over here really quick and just show off Kona. So Kona, as you can notice by my background actually, is an Aussie Shepherd named after a real dog in real life. We basically turned it into a little Slack app to be almost like a remote worker's best friend in Slack. So every single day, Kona has several different habits. One of those is a red, yellow, green check-in habit. Just like we just checked in with red, yellow, green, your teammates can check in their own basically group channels. So marketing APAC, let's just say, can have its own channel. Sales SDRs in the Southwest can have their own locked channel. And these teams are basically checking in with one another, sharing how they're feeling and what's going on. So today I'll check in a little bit yellow and I can choose from a number of different custom emojis. We have really funny ones, but today will be capybara. And I can talk about my workload. It's a little bit much today and just talk about how today feels really chaotic but I'm super excited for the inside HR presentation that I'm actively giving. <laughs> That's amazing. I love how creative this whole interface is. Yeah, and you can attach images. I'm not gonna make you go through my entire image log and stuff because there's probably embarrassing stuff on there, but I'm just gonna hit submit. And essentially, as you can see, we can start to see the other teammates that have checked in. I can see how many meetings they have. I can see that Monica is bringing it. I can see Amanda's a little bit tired. And so if I'm a manager of these two, I can basically know day to day what's going on and how I can support these folks. I can also see like whether or not there's a red that happens or some sort of work related mishap that happens, essentially driving a lot more visibility on what's going on at work. And some really cool features, Kona has a overall, oops, <laughs> it has an overall feature and function to help support folks in the moment. So as I'm checking in with yellow or orange, for example, Kona can actually send specific types of approaches, offer coaching. This, for example, is an example of coaching around fee feedback that Kona has brought to my attention and also one-on-one -on -one briefs. There are a bunch of different types of habits, like I mentioned. So essentially prepping for one-on-ones is one of them. Red, yellow, green, which you've just witnessed. We have a gratitude habit that happens every Friday that I can try digging around for. The idea basically being that folks can really share how they're feeling as a team, get support in the moment, get AI-based support from Kona itself, and get the kind of habits and help from their manager that they might need. So this is just a quick little taste of what Kona can do. There's a lot more, but just for sake of time, I think I'm going to stop sharing here and okay dive in. yeah and yes. as a, oh sorry as a quick little call out and stuff you can start you can get started with kona so long as you have slack we have a free version that's very fun to use and can incorporate a lot of team bonding rituals into your day-to-day Yay. Love it. Thank you. Yeah, you were just mentioning habits a moment ago. Irina asks, can you speak to building habits like telling employees to walk? So you talked about how Kona is a good tool for managers. How can a manager encourage healthy habits? Yeah, this is a really interesting question because I think there's so many different facets to it. The first thing I'll say is if you are the manager of that team or at least a leader of that team, modeling those behaviors can go a long way. Taking walks, let's just say a manager posts a selfie from their daily walk and they're always standing next to a different type of tree. That's a very easy way to signal to the rest of your team, hey, walks are something that I encourage you to do and I'm super excited to see you do it too. Also establishing different safeguards. So as an HR team, a few ways you can create like a walking challenge. Let's just say folks can get rewards and recognition for participating in the set challenge. 
You can also make it so folks are actively encouraged to take walks. That might go into actually problem solving different types of blockers, but it could be that folks don't have time to leave their desk because they're trapped in back-to-back -back meetings for the entirety of their Wednesday. So if suddenly we make Wednesday into a no meeting day, that actually may encourage folks to take walks, walk their dog, be able to spend more time with their kids. And those kind of systemic things can have huge impacts on well-being and mental health. So that's just like a quick little answer to your question. Hopefully that tackled it. Great. Josh says, why did you build Kona specifically for Slack? Do you have an independent app? Yeah, I really love this question. We built Kona for Slack because after doing research with over a thousand remote managers, everybody was using Slack. Whenever we asked, would you use a separate web app or a separate kind of phone mobile app? They basically pushed back and said, no, I want something that slots into our workflow that makes it super easy to be where I'm at and work for them meant being in Slack. And so it made total sense to create a Slack app on top of that. And I think because of that, the beauty is that Kona is super lightweight. We take advantage of a lot of Slack emojis and Slack culture that's happening. And as a result, Kona feels pretty seamless and low lift. I'm glad that you started talking about the research you did as you were developing this product. You were part of the Techstars Accelerator. I'm sure you talked with so many people. Can you tell us more about those conversations and what you learned? Yeah, I love that this is a group of founders because y'all get it. When it comes to making this product, we definitely did not get it right on the first try. As a matter of fact, when we were accepted into Techstars, the MD, Anna Barber at the time, she actually said, we accepted you in spite of your product, not because of the product. <laughs> We what was it? Because of your team. Originally, Kona was a little creepy. It was an AI manager tool slotted into your Slack workspace and built work with me guides based off of how you're checking in. And checking in is in not submitting, just literally writing and acting and behaving. And a lot deeper of an integration, a little creepy. And we just had to completely scrap that and move on to the actual thing we needed to do, which is well being and a lot more manager centric tooling there. That's interesting. Did you mention that you talked with a lot of managers? Did you have conversations with people that weren't in that leadership position too? And how did you get a feel for the levels of burnout and poor mental health in the different levels of professionals? Yeah, I will say that like I use managers very much as a catch-all tool or term. It's basically in reference to anybody that manages a team. But we talk to VPs, CXOs, directors of entire departments. We talk to HRBPs, people ops folks, literally anybody that would talk to us. And through that, we learned a lot about the different types of stakeholders in a great culture and the different types of facets of employee experience. And a big kind of spoiler alert, it's not just HR's like role to take care of employee experience and culture. It's everybody's collective responsibility. So speaking of HR professionals, for those that have that designation that are, is that first line of defense when employees have some sort of mental health crisis, heaven forbid, what, I mean, I know, I don't know how comfortable you feel answering this question, but what do they do? What advice do you have for those HR people, what, especially considering like privacy and confidentiality? Yeah, it's really tough because so many HR professionals are being put in really tough positions to talk about really sensitive issues. The other day I was speaking with an HR friend and she was talking about how a coworker was openly chatting about how they were contemplating suicide. And we are we already know that definitely t dips into HIPAA compliance and kind of the hairier realms of that. I think the crucial thing to remember is unless you are a trained therapist, please share that you are not a trained therapist when offering any sort of advice and direct this person to resources if they are able and willing to take advantage of them. I think knowing, I think this is where the boundaries part of the workshop becomes really important, but knowing your own boundaries and capabilities as a support system can go a really long way and also protect you from potential liability as a company. Yeah, excellent. So when you were developing this product, you went through this amazing accelerator, Techstars. Kona just raised a $4 million seed round. I know that you guys have been working hard, you and your co-founders. So what were some coping strategies that helped you as you were doing all this hard work? Yeah, a few things. One, it's very helpful to have a product that's living in our own Slack that's constantly asking us how we're feeling. And as folks that are trying to lead a product that actively builds psychological safety, we have to act in practice what we preach. And so in a lot of ways, being honest about how we're feeling to one another and to the rest of our team, sharing actively when we're struggling, those have gone tremendous ways. 
all their alternatives and I'll just speak for myself because I don't want to speak on behalf of my two co-founders, but I have executive coaches. I have a therapist that I see bi-weekly. I cannot advocate for therapy enough. Please go to therapy. It's not just for folks that are mentally ill or have mental illness. Anybody can go to therapy. Highly recommend also meditation apps. I use Headspace very much and I love it very much. And also just regular exercise. I actively play golf and I also do Krav Maga now, which is very fun. And having, again, <laughs> an ability to sweat it out has made the world of a difference. Such a good answer. We are very soon going to hear from someone from BetterHelp. So I'm so glad you're telling everyone, hey, anyone can go to therapy. Exactly. Okay. To wrap things up, I love that there's a lot of helpful conversations in the media today. Like I'm thinking of Jonah Hill's Henry Stutz about his therapist and the series Ted Lasso, where like the main character deals with panic attacks and you can see him work through that. Do you have any books, shows, or movies that you feel are really moving the mental health conversation forward in a positive way? Oh, absolutely. How long do you have? Because <laughs> I can get <laughs> all this stuff. I think the first one that really stands out is Dr. Devin Price's Laziness Does Not Exist. That is one of my favorite books so far. It really decouples the reason why we feel this need to work to prove our self-worth and just the ways that puts us in position to constantly be opening new stress cycles rather than actively closing more than we open. Other ones, like there's one just called Burnout that I can definitely <laughs> label for. It's written by two twins that are fantastic. I can basically get you a whole list, but I also heavily recommend that if you're into reading books, that you join our manager book club. We essentially are tackling a mental health read as of next month for mental health awareness month. And I think it can be really helpful. I need to find a way to send that to you so you can go and send that to other folks, Stephanie. Okay. Awesome. If you apply for a manager book club, you can join us as we read and talk about these active different projects. And it's really fun. Okay, so that link is Yay. Manager Book Club. Alrighty. <laughs> book clubs online are like the thing of 2023, I think. It's a good yeah, idea. Definitely. I and do, I think it's, yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, sorry. It's been really fun. We have over 200 managers from some amazing companies like Lego, Allbirds, SAP, Meta, you name it. And so join those leaders and myself as we go and read more books on mental health, proper management, and feedback. It's really exciting stuff. Very cool. Yen, thank you so much for your time and for sharing all that you have. We really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. And everyone go check out heykona.com and the manager book club. That's pretty cool.